welcome back everybody. Welcome back to part two of the Black Theology Forum at the Centre for Black Theology here at Queen's. My name's Dulcie Dixon McKenzie. I'm delighted that we are in conversation with Professor Alan Ubri, South Af um, African pastor and theologian. In this part of the evening, we're going to be having a conversation together with four of our postgraduate students here at Queen's. We have the Centre for Black Theology that hosts students primarily, but not exclusively, from Pentecostal churches and uh, each have their own area of interest, each have their own ministry and practice, and they have their own area of concern where the church is concerned. And so we're going to be hearing from four of our students. First of all, we're going to hear from David Gibbs, and then we're going to be hearing from Carolyn Henry, and then we're going to be hearing from David White, and then we're going to be hearing from Florence Nowako, Nowako um, she's going to help me with her surname uh, shortly. And um, we're going to be hearing their specific question to Professor Allen this evening. But in the meantime, feel free to continue with your questions in the chat. And if we get a chance at the end of the evening, then we'll be able to hopefully include your question. So, um, Alan, we're going to be joined now by David Gibbs. David Gibbs has been a student at Queen's for some nearly three, four years now, if not longer. He started as an undergraduate student, went on to um, do the BA. Uh, he started off doing a diploma, do the BA. Now he's doing the master's. And we're looking forward to him engaging more with black theology by way of um, a PhD. But in the meantime, David is a regional pastor for his church, which is called Grace Communion Church. And we have noticed a growth in David, particularly in his preaching, because in his preaching now and his ministry and his research, it revolves very much around justice. And Alan is very stricken by you. And he says something that you have quoted previously somewhere else, the more you say Jesus, the more you say justice, and the more you say justice, the more you say Jesus. And so he loves your radical approach and he values your book, Radical Re Reconciliation, and is here this evening with a specific question to you in relation to black theology. So thank you, David, and over to you with Professor Buzak. Thank you, Dr. Dolce, and thank you, Professor uh, Buzak, and good evening, everyone. So I, I'm not gonna give the full quote, but just part of the quote from, from the paper you presented. You, you asked, how do we rekindle and retain our vitality as a black church, a community, and as black people? You also linked uh, the historic triplets of black consciousness, black theology and black power. So my, my question to you is, what is the connection or relationship between black theology, critical race theory and Black Lives Matter, which you, you talked about today? Thank you, David, uh, for that question. There is of course a very intimate relationship between uh, all, of, all of these. Uh, black consciousness uh, became uh, a philosophy um, in the United States and South Africa in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. And in South Africa uh, became quite a dominant way of thinking for a vast majority of especially young people. Um, it changed my own outlook on, on, on politics and on the reality of our South African situation quite fundamentally. Um, and one of the things that Black Consciousness was saying to us even then was a thing that we had learned uh, from, um, from a, a sociologist in the United States See Eric Lincoln, um, who made who, who made the case that th this thinking about race and so forth is a trap politically, culturally, psychologically, um, and in every single way. And he says, just remember that the race is a construct, a a political and social construct invented for the control of of people of color. Um, uh, it is a way to tell you that you are not part of the human race, not quite equal to the humanity of those people who call themselves white. 
Uh, afterwards, there was a book that was written by um, a white person whose name escapes me now, and it's called The Creation of the White Race, and why that was necessary. Um, and so um, we, we came to understand that, and we also came to understand that this whole racial categorization thing is, is by design, it was a way of the apartheid government to divide what we then came to call the community of the oppressed. Um, and so what they did through colonialism and apartheid in South Africa, they divided us into all these categories, racial categories. And so Stephen Biko was called a Bantu. Uh, I was called a colored, uh, 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 somebody else was called an Indian, even though they were in South Africa. Uh, and we were categorized down the ladder. On top, of course, was the white people, the white race, and they were untouchable, and they were almost divine, and they were chosen by God, and all of that, and therefore given power over us. We came to understand all of that. So I'm now talking late 1960s, early 1970s. Critical race theory is, is a very, very recent development, but not very different from what I have just been saying. So it teaches us to think critically about this concept of race, why it is so necessary, why it is so unmissable for those in the dominant society. So even though numerically, for instance, people of color uh, dominate the world, politically, economically, it is the minority calling themselves white that is in fact dominating the world. So you ask the question, why is that? Um, why is it that there is such a clear discriminating difference between the way systems of power work and react to the black presence in those societies? And it is true if you look at the legal systems, at the court systems, at police um, and, and their reaction uh, in every single way, at the banks, at the capitalist system, all of that. The, 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 and, and, and the race thing has been so important and we have been caught up in that and what black consciousness and critical race theory want to tell us is you've got to shift your mind away from that. But um, so we have a little bit of a dilemma. So we don't want to think in terms of race, but because remember what I said in the beginning that John Subrino said, the task of liberation theology is not to lose sight of the realities that we are facing. So whilst we know there's no such thing as race, and certainly not one type of race that is supposed to be superior to the other, we do know that because race is so important a category for the system of oppression and exploitation and subjugation to work, we've got to deal with it. But so we approach it from that point, not because we revere it or we accept it or we embrace it, because we understand it as an entity that needs to be attacked, exposed, broken down, destroyed in order for the humanity of all to find its place in our hearts, in our thinking, in our way of life, and in our structures and systems and institutions that we try to build in society. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, David. That was a great question. Do you want to stay there now whilst we introduce Carolyn, our next student? Carolyn now is uh, Karen, Carolyn Henry. She is a, a member of the National Youth Board for the New Testament Church of God in England hmm. and Wales, which is one of our larger black majority churches here in the UK. And she's been actively involved in various youth ministry leadership positions since 20, 2007. And uh, Carolyn's um, been with us now for about a year, pursuing a PhD. And her area of interest is a new youth ministry approach in the UK, specifically including the black experience within the strategy for content and delivery. So that includes what's been taught to the young people of, of New Tea in terms of Sunday school and YPE and all the rest of it. So, so this is where <laughs> coming from. But this is what Carolyn is saying about black theology and what it's doing for her because she's doing it for the very first time here at Queen's. Being a student at Queen's has been extremely insightful, helpful and vital in, in my education about black theology, sparking 
the beginning of an exciting, dynamic journey in my own Black experience. It's Absolutely. great having you on, Marilyn. Over to you now with Professor. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor, for your wonderful presentation. I hope that my own PhD would be as beautifully written as your paper. Um, yeah, so Black theology is a, it's a theology of the marginalized, as is mentioned in your paper. And you also highlighted that the circumstances of COVID-19 unmasked a number of the inequalities that we have in our society. There's so many issues when we talk about social justice, you know, sex trafficking, domestic abuse, abortion, etc. I have a question. Do you believe that there is a hierarchy for matters of social justice? Or should or can they all be considered equal in their importance? Thank you so much uh, for that question, Callan, and my best wishes to you as you continue uh, this work, this important work with the youth. I mean, that's where that's where it's all happening. Thank um, you. So let me so let me just say, no, I do not believe in such a hierarchy. But let me background this. There was a time in our own struggles. Um, and you will find me going back to my own experience quite a lot because I would rather speak to you from out of what I have seen and heard and lived and experienced um, and learned rather than philosophizing about some theory. Um, so in our own struggle, as I have indicated before, I think, we had such a hierarchy. We thought that the main thing of our South African struggle was for racial justice, to get rid of apartheid and its racist structures. And that was important. But because we prioritized that to the extent that we excluded other concerns, we made a mistake. We thought when the women talked to us about gender justice, we always said to them, but your concerns are automatically included in the larger struggle. So don't worry about it. And by the way, we are so much better than these people who are ruling us now. Once we get into power, all your concerns will be addressed. Well, it didn't happen that way mm -hmm. and we were wrong. Um, the same, I mean, we at least talk to the women about their concerns. Also because the women would not let us get away with it. Uh, the 1956 march of 20,000 women on, 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 on government offices uh, in Pretoria, union buildings to confront the then prime minister um, was done without the men. The women told the men, you stay at home. This is our thing here. Um, and it was, it, 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 was, it was such an important thing that today, the 9th of August, is designated as a public holiday and it's called Women's Day to honor that. But I mean, we're good at symbols. And so we honor the women. You marched in 1956 and you sang that song, Straight on, you touched a woman, you struck a rock, and so forth. But what does it really mean? Because of that hierarchy that we worked with then has not been dismantled right now. So no, I think all of the concerns should be and can be incorporated. One of the wonderful things about the Black Lives Matter movement now at this point in history is that it began as a movement for the concern of what happened to black lives in the United States after the civil rights struggle and the so-called gains that they have made in all those days. They had forgotten that Martin Luther King had said in, uh, in, in his book uh, that came out in 1967, Chaos or Community, um, that he said, look, the struggle thus far, now we won uh, the right to vote. We've got the Civil Rights Act, so we've got those two major pieces of legislation. But that, he said, was only the first phase. Mm. 
Mm. The second phase is beginning now. And the second phase is going to be much more risky, much more dangerous, because black people are no longer going to ask for a place at the counter to have a hamburger next to a white person or to sit in the bus next to a white person. That's no longer the issue. Mm. It never was the goal. It was a means to get to the second phase. But this phase is going to ask fundamental questions of the structures of American society, the systems of injustice. And had Martin Luther King lived, he would have said the third phase should be the inclusion of all of these issues for everyone who is struck by injustice. And he had already begun to talk about that, not just in the United States, but he was seeing the broader world and the world revolution that he was urging Americans to join. And um, so for us now, Black Lives Matter is no longer just Black Lives. If you watch those marches in the US and elsewhere, you see the rainbow flag there, LGBTQ people out there people who realize that we have uh, an environmental climate crisis on our hands, people who are beginning to understand the exploitative and deadly nature of new liberal capitalism and the way those systems work, people who are fighting for equality in education, people who are fighting to just what I call the struggle against remembrance, um, and, and, and that means that they are saying Black Lives Matter now, and we are fighting for that. But remember, there's a whole history in which Black Lives did not matter. So in Belgium, you find these young Black folks together with some white Belgian folks, and they come up and they say, King Leopold II, that you honor with, with, with busts and, and statues in every possible place um, in this country. He was a murderer, an imperialist. And remember that under him, 10 million Congolese were slaughtered. That's almost twice the number of the Jews that died in, under Hitler in Nazi Germany. And so the question is, why is the one Holocaust remembered and honored, but that Holocaust is hidden and forgotten? And you can't talk about it because then you bring up something that make people in power mm. with power and privilege and status. You make them uncomfortable. Um, and, and so, but Black Lives Matter brings all those concerns together. It is one of the most amazing features of this revolution. And so that's why I keep on saying, now it is possible, LGBTQ people, all those concerns, because in the end, we are fighting what we now call a matrix of coloniality and of power. So the, the, the systems that we are facing, they are not making all these differences. It is, it is heteronormative, it is patriarchal, it is neoliberal capitalist, it is exploitative, it is oppressive, it is racist, it is white supremacist, it is, it is all of those things together, and they hit us with that matrix of power. It is a mistake for us to say, oh, uh, Carolyn, your issue is uh, youth, go demonstrate elsewhere, or your issue is gender, or your issue is LGBTQI, you can't be with me. No, we're all in this together or we are not at all. This is the only way in which we're going to make a difference in this world and undermine and overcome the systems of oppression that in their heart is all joined together. And so we must join together and must not go back to the mistake of dividing ourselves because we think that my issue, my black issue is more important than your gender issue or your LGBTQI issue. So no, um, that's where we are. And I'm hoping that we are learning these things and that we are actually making it the reality of our revolution as we, as we go on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alan. And thank you for your great question, Carolyn. If you'll stay there for us, along with David. Let's invite now another David. And David is now a student who's began his time at Queen's on a taster course. 
David thought, oh, I'll just give it a taste, just see what it's about. And that was some four, five years ago, he started on a taster. He got involved and then he did a diploma. And here he is now doing a master's. And again, we're praying that he will pursue a PhD. So just to introduce David, David White, he is the youth pastor in the Wesleyan Holiness Church here in the UK. And his role is to support churches, ministers and leaders to engage with young people in churches and communities within the denomination of the Wesleyan Holiness Church. Also, his role is to connect, partner and collaborate with other ministries and organisations that support and engage with young people. David has a passion for music and I know in his other secular life, so to speak, he was a teacher. And so the importance of learning and teaching about the historical role of Christianity in Africa and its impact is really, really part of his concern. How music of black origin provides a social, religious, political and economic commentary in using scripture and black theology as a means of interpreting the times. So Alan, David is really delighted to, to be talking to you this evening because he's, he, he, he wants to recognise how your commentary and your work in critiquing the white church from your own tradition um, and walking the walk in promoting and demonstrating a framework that dismantles the racist structures and racist ideologies in the church and is, is impressed with how you galvanize people to action and to see that there are inextricably linked to Jesus and freedom and justice. So David, this is your time now with Professor Allen. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Dolsey. Um, Professor mm -hmm. Allen, um, again, as what um, David and Carolina said, a fantastic uh, piece of work that you've um, that you've presented. My question um, is is linked to what Caroline mentioned earlier. You highlight that black theology is a theology of those who are marginalised, which uh, seeks to bring them to the centre of God's revolutionary actions in the world. So, for me, in what ways can black theology utilise and critique the music of the youth who often feel marginalised to bring them to the centre? as it were. Well, thank you uh, for that uh, question, David. Um, and thank you for the work that you're doing, as I've heard. Um, you guys are very much involved with young people um, and that impresses me. Um, and you're also involved with music and you know that black people cannot live without music. And it's not just because music is music, it's because for a very, very long time, music was all we had. Think about that. Um, the black slaves that were taken from Africa to the United States um, had no community where they went to, no church in the beginning, um, no way of communicating with one another. Um, the same is true of the slaves that were brought to South Africa from Angola, and Mozambique um, and the East, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, the East Coast of India, and so forth, and so forth. They couldn't even communicate with one another. The, the one place where they found one another is in the music that they made. Um, that is why the, in the United States, the blues that said something about the black condition in a way that at that time, they had no preachers to say anything about that. Um, uh, jazz that became that unique expression of black music and, 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 and the gospel songs, all of these forms intertwined with one another. That was the lifeblood of black survival in those days. Frank Fanon, Franz Fanon has a as a wonderful paragraph in which he says that colonialism, he, he describes colonialism as, as a, a virtual apocalypse. And he says it was so comprehensive, so totalitarian, so all consuming that it would not even allow the music of black people to remain their own. They would invade those spaces. Remember music for us was a place of refuge 
That's where we find our dignity when we couldn't find it anywhere else. Um, and so, so, so music and blackness, music and black survival, music and, and, and black existence, music and black hope, it's all together is inextricably bound to one another. That is why in our struggles, even today, yeah, man, I mean, the unions just go and they demonstrate against some government decision. And, and, and the first thing they do before they verbalize their demands is they come down the street, toy toying, you know, you go, we singing something, something. Um, you can't do it without singing. And so many, and the church came in here because so many of our freedom songs were songs from the church. Um, we just changed the words sometimes. Uh, like a tree standing by the waterside, we shall not be moved. Where's that? That psalm, what is that psalm? Psalm two or something, right? Um, so that, that reference is always there. So it's music is so important for us that we have to ask the question, how is it possible that that music that was at times our only link both to what we remembered from our past, who we really are, and the divine who made us what we are. That, all, that music was that only channel that we allow that music to be used to bludgeon us into submission in a way that white people could sometimes never even do. That is for me the question of much of the music, rap music, and the violence that it does to black women, for instance, and the images that it creates for young black boys to think of young black women, internalizing, reinforcing the worst aspects of white racism and white supremacy. So it, it may very well be that they go there because the way in which the church has alienated them because we don't want to understand their situation or the ways in which they are forced to think has driven them and the anger that they, that they show in their music is in fact, and that they now take out upon each other, other young people like them, because they talk about young black women in the way that they talk. They talk about other young blacks as they say, die, nigga, die, that kind of thing. Is, 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 is an expression of the anger that they feel towards the church and its exclusionary ways and its haughty ways and its arrogant ways, not willing to listen, not willing to learn, not willing to open up, not willing to accept them for what they are and accompany them to find something new. That alienation is now used as a self-destructive weapon. And so instead of judgment, we should first ask the question, is it perhaps something that we have done or something that we have not done? All the while knowing and accepting and understanding, if we let go of music, we let go of something so precious that black existence might not even be possible. We might be there, but we might not be a living, exuding entity. So it's, uh, yeah, so, so be critical about that music, know why it is happening, ask critical questions about ourselves, restore, always, always, always offer them new ways, not to chase their challenge out of the door, but to say to them, bring your talent here and let's see whether we can do something with that, challenge, with that talent, purify it, if you will, bring it home, bring it home, bring it where it belongs and then um, music for them might become something meaningful um, again. But you should not stop asking that particular question and not stop believing that their talent might be misguided or abused, but it's still a talent that is not beyond redemption. Thank you. Thank you for your question, David. And on that point, actually, the, uh, in terms of music, I remember you saying in your paper, the theology of hymnology in the church, we are too often what we are, what we sing, and then uh, we are given a hymnified theology of otherworldliness, 
probably too much you're saying, Alan. So thank you for that. Now, before we um, hear from our next student, let me just ask you a question from one of our students in the audience, Nathan Turner. And he himself is, is a, a pastor, uh, uh, as, as well as a youth pastor. And he asked this question linked to what you said earlier, Alan. Black theology is ecumenical. So here's Nathan's question. How would you advise millennials to be radically black in white spaces? Well, um, it is ecumenical in the sense that we should not allow the denominations to which we belong to render apart what should be unified and together. So it doesn't really matter uh, to me which church you belong to. Steve Biko was so critical of the church. He was actually saying that the problem with the church is that it presents a Jesus to me that is so foreign to me that, that he has nothing to say to me. Now that's a serious judgment. Um, so that's what denominational thinking does to you. Now that's the one thing. But the other part of, of what you are saying um, is that black theology is a theology that should give expression to that deepest humanity that is within us. Um, we, can't, we can't allow anything external that comes with divisions and things like that to become more important and and, and act as if that was the priority that we um, are dealing with. And so for me, um, the ecumenicity of black theology is also the openness uh, that, we, that we do our theology with. But I think I missed some other part of that question that I'm trying to get to. No, I think you've dealt with it. It, it was just in terms of your, you stated that it's ecumenical, black theology is ecumenical. So how would you advise millennials to be radically black in white spaces? Oh, that's what I was going to say. Radically black is also unapologetically black. But Jeremiah Wright, who was my friend, um, when he was pastor of Trinity United uh, uh, Church in Chicago, had developed a slogan for his church. And that slogan was unapologetically black, and unashamedly Christian. Mm. Um, so as a Christian, I live, as a black Christian, I live. And, and that is what they should, that's part of your identity. And you can only be ecumenical, you can only be non-racial if you have accepted unapologetically that you are a black person. And as a black person, you open your heart and your life to everybody else. But you can't start an ecumenical or non-racial existence in life by denying who you are. And who you are is what you will bring to the table, is your contribution to the wholeness, not only of yourself, of that other person as well that you engage with. Thank you, Alan. Let's finish off the evening, shall we, talking about womanist theology. And now we're going to be hearing from Florence, uh, one of our MA students who did her BA in theology with Professor Robert Beckford whilst he was at Canterbury Christ Church. And so Professor Beckford, along with Dr. Valentina Alexander, and along with Dr. Gifford Ramey, uh, the four of us really are, are very much part of the, the teaching team and the nurturing team of the next generation of black theologians here in the UK. Not only black theology, but womanist theology. And so we have Florence now who wants everyone to know that she is a Nigerian woman, proud, and she's a mother of four children and a grandmother of two, a boy and a girl. And her passion for womanist theology, Alan, is born out of her own personal life experience. She often talks very deeply, passionately in the classroom about her own family. She was born in a polygamous family and her mother was marginalized for being a male, not for not being a male child. And she was thrown out of the home, causing uh, her to know where she is today and 
has a lot to do with her own experience. So the factor has necessitated her to study Latin mm -hmm. liberation theology and most especially womanist theology. And she's passionate about the plight of black women. So Florence, there is a reason why you're last this evening. And uh, we're gonna go over the time, but I think people will be very forgiving once they hear your question and once they hear part of the answer that um, Professor Allen's going to be giving us this evening. Thanks, Florence. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dossie. Uh, good evening, Professor Balzac. Um, um, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in your talk today. Good evening, Dr. Dulcie. Thank you for all that you do for us and how you help me out with my uh, difficult questions. And good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Bozak, I'm currently engaging in your book, The Children of the Waters of Meribah, a Black Liberation Theology in Miriam Tradition and the Challenges of the 21st Century. In your introduction chapter, you talk about um, more, one more river to cross. And to me, it speaks of crossing the waters as a metaphor for overcoming struggles uh, uh, for freedom. And in your paper, you spoke of uh, a South African womanist theologian from the sewer called who tells of a reflection after visiting the infamous um, uh, uh, castle dungeon where these uh, African women were atrociously treated by their uh, enslavers. I, I can't even begin to reiterate some of what you wrote here. And so my question then is, um, it says, that being so many years ago, and, and not so long ago in this, our modern times, how, um, how have these women, or how is their experience, how does this reflect on the experiences now? And what are the church, the black church in particular, what are they doing or have done uh, to support uh, black women um, in this their journey of marginalization and derogatory? Thank you very much for, uh, for that very important question, um, um, Florence. I, to begin with what you said last, I'm afraid um, the church has not done much to support women in their struggles against marginalization. In fact, the church has not done much in terms of some of those old negative African cultural attitudes and practices that were designed to keep women oppressed and on the margins and silenced. Um, much of what we see the churches are doing today with regard to women is also as a result of colonialism. And those churches who sent their missionaries from Europe um, to our continent, those missionaries brought their own patriarchal and heteronormative ideas and practices uh, to Africa um, and elsewhere, and even where there were African societies that had a matriarchal system, they turned that completely around. I suspect is because the men were easier to bribe with the semblances of power that colonialism offered them than were the women. Um, that's my suspicion. I suspect also that somewhere there is a paper written by a woman who would prove that, if I can find that. Africa, um, African women have come into their own in the last 15 years or so, in a way, and I do not mean this paternalistically, I hope, in a way that has completely helped to change my mind and my way of thinking and has made me extraordinarily proud. Proud because for a while, the only women's voices in theology that we heard and that was allowed to be heard came from the United States. Yes. That situation is now completely changed. Mm -hmm. um, 
womanist theology in the United States um, is, is extraordinarily important for that situation, but also for ours across the world. But African women are bringing perspectives that not even black women in the United States um, understand anymore. I mean this, uh, African women write, for instance, about African cultural practices that have issues with women's blood in a way that is no longer the case in the United States. But without that perspective from Africa, half the stuff that Jesus was doing with regard to women in the New Testament is lost to us. We don't understand it. To open our eyes for that reality of that Jesus with our situation today and Jesus now is only African women. Just as there are women in India with that particular cultural situation who write about Jesus as a liberator, but open perspectives from that Indian situation that we don't know, that we don't understand. We don't know what the caste system does. Now we know in general what the caste system does to the Dalits, for instance. But if you hear a woman theologian from the Dalit community, it is as if I'm hearing the gospel for the first time. So, and I mean, and I, and I, and I listen and I, and I sat there and I did once when we were in Egypt with the World Communion of Reformed Churches. And, and, and there was a woman there who, who came from India and she spoke and another one um, who came from Bangladesh and she spoke. And I sat there listening and all I could say was, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, because this is how minds are opened and hearts are opened and ways of thinking and perspectives are changed. And so women, women's theology from the United States, from Africa, from Asia, have now carved out for themselves a common niche, but also separately, but separately and together, they are opening the eyes of male theologians, they are opening the eyes of the church. Now, the church, I love the church, but the church I love sometimes doesn't exist. So we love the women because, and we honor the women. We have these long sermons on Mother's Day. And then for the rest of the year, we forget. But we know that we can't live without the women. The black church can't do without the women. The women are the backbone of the church. The women is what the, keeps the church alive. And so we know we need them for that. But the moment a woman claims equality in ministry, equality in solidarity, equality in preaching, equality in leading, then we feel so certain that we would rather die than let that woman have that space. And so we are, we are recognizing the women as long as they keep themselves in their place. And if they can't keep themselves in their place, we will keep them in their place. And so the church, because we are a patriarchal church. You know, I read a book um, about the Zimbabwean revolution and the scholar was arguing, the reason why the Zimbabwean revolution failed was because it was a patriarchal revolution. And if you read that book and if you think about it, you think, well, yeah, that's why most of the so-called independent struggles in Africa have failed because it, 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 it was only a patriarchal kind of change and transformation that did not bring any transformation. And so I say all of that to say to you that you must not at all let go of what you're doing. Don't allow any man to tell you where you are supposed to go and how far you are supposed to go and how high you are supposed to go. You determine 
the course of your study, the course of your life, the course of your ministry, according to the gift and the power that the Holy Spirit has given you. And she is moving you where you are going right now. So the church needs to be redeemed. The church needs to be changed. The church needs to be transformed. The church needs a new Pentecost. And as long as men are ruling the church in the way that we are doing right now, the Holy Spirit is not in us. They st she's standing outside forlorn like an orphan child. And we got to go back, take the hand of that orphan child, and we will find if we take the hand of that orphan child, we'll be taking the hand of a woman. And it's only when that happens that the church can see salvation again and begin to mean something to the world. That's my, that's, that's my feeling. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, just what you said about, uh, in my research, my paper that I'm writing for my um, postgraduate, it talks about, I, I'm actually looking for um, why the women leadership in the churches is so uh, depleted. And I, my, all my papers, my research, everything, as you said, coming from America, there's hardly much here in Britain. So I want to engage, or in the UK, shall I say, so I want to engage and make this, um, make this literature quite more available uh, because I, I am not getting anything for the black women of this, um, of this region. We have African women who have um, left their places and who have made homes here. We have the diasporian uh, mm -hmm. African uh, and black women who live here, yet there is nothing for them to, um, to steady them on in actually trying to retrieve their or reclaim their Africanness or their womanness or their black womanhood. And so for me, I am trying to, um, to really uh, bring about some awareness here because this um, marginalization of black women is so very subliminal as if it doesn't exist, but it does exist because we meet it every day. And women talk to me every day about um, this thing that I'm doing, how is it that they don't know about it, you know, and they want to know about it. So how can I go about, you know, to engage with the, with the, with the Britain or, 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 or the UK? How do I establish, how do I go about to make sure that this thing is easily available for the women who come to me and ask me, how do I go about that? Well, two or three quick things. Number one, um, since there is so little available right there, from black women in Britain, go find uh, the women that are most immediate to your experience in Africa, um, read them and, and introduce the women uh, in your circles to them. Number two, um, you got to, apart from your working on your PhD, you got to learn to write some stuff that the women in the churches can find accessible. Right. So I, I've, I've, I've had a thing for myself that I say, if you cannot preach it, don't write it. I mean by that, if I think of something, unless I can, I can say it in a sermon to a congregation that will understand in language that is clear, and unambivalent, I will not write it because I am not into theology to engage in pontifications with my peers. That's not why I do theology. And there's a colleague of mine who says to me, why do you write in this way? Just as soon as you get into some scholarly argument, then the next page you sound as if you preach it. I say, well, that is my exact idea. That's my design. I want to do that because I want the theology that I write to be written in such a way that the preacher who reads that book must say, oh, I can, I can preach from this on Sunday. Oh, two pages later, this is a new sermon. Like the Black Americans say, this one will preach. That's how I want to write. That's what you got to do. Thirdly, don't wait for men to create the space for you. They never will. They'll die before they do that. You claim that space. You take it for yourself and you stand upon it 
and the God you love and the Jesus whom you admire and worship and the Holy Spirit who empowers you will help you do that from the word go. So don't you worry about all of that. You just do what you have to do. Thank, thank you so Lord. much, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to spend, um, f finish off with two more things this evening, if I can. And that is to ask you, first of all, uh, Alan, if you can say a bit more about this book in relation to womanist theology, because this is my favorite of your books. You know, there's so <laughs> many of them, you know. But as, as I do this, my question to you is this. See, there's another one. <laughs> okay. And another one. <laughs> and another one <laughs> and that's the first edition wasn't it of black theology and black power okay that's right. dare we speak but well, we're going to come back to my favorite one in a moment and the fire within yep this is you yeah. 52 years of ministry and theological engagement there's something you do in this book that is very very special i think and you talk about moses and miriam and if i could just say the way not I can't say it the way you can say it, but you say it, but you basically say we start the story of Moses in the wrong place. And so I know our biblical scholars may or may not appreciate what you have to say, but I wonder if you can just say a bit more about that, please. How when we talk about um, Exodus, it's Moses that's at, that is at the forefront of that narrative. But you critique that and you say, no, we shouldn't. Why not? Because I think that there are in fact two traditions in the Bible about the Exodus and what it means. The one tradition is the tradition of Moses and the other tradition is the tradition of Miriam. The Miriam tradition begins long before Moses with the two midwives, Sifra and Puah in the birthing chamber and with the demand and the command of the Pharaoh to kill all the Hebrew babies. And that first act of resistance and disobedience by the midwives begins the story of the liberation. It does not begin with a burning bush. It begins with a woman. By the time we get to the burning bush, Exodus chapter one, Exodus chapter two has this strange, Exodus chapter one has the strange ending. Exodus two then comes to Moses. Um, and almost as if what has been told in the previous chapter and a half does not matter. The women have raised that question about the Exodus. And there are women theologians, and I have been convinced by their arguments who say, the, the, the Exodus tradition that runs through Miriam is the tradition that begins in the birthing chamber against the Pharaoh, runs through Miriam on the, sea, on the, on the riverbank and on the seashore in Exodus chapter 15, where we get the song of Miriam, and then it ends. The tradition that begins with Moses is a second tradition. And because it is a male tradition, it suppresses mm. the original tradition of the women that begins and ends with Miriam. And um, that is a tradition that when it comes to the seashore, you have what clearly is now the consensus of scholars is the song of Miriam that all of a sudden becomes the song of Moses. So Miriam is chapter 15 verses one and two, and then at the end, 19 and 20. In between is the song of Moses. But that is an extrapolation. It's an expansion of what Miriam has said. But if you read the tone of verses one and two and 19 and 20, it's totally different from the tone and the language that Moses is supposed to have sung in those verses in between. Um, that, is, that is the tradition that does not end at, at the seashore, but goes on into the promised land, which becomes a land of conquest 
and stolen land, land theft, and the obliteration and the annihilation of all the peoples from which the Israelites, in the name of God, is now laying possession on that land. That is not the Exodus tradition. That is an interpretation to justify land theft and annihilation and genocide. So when it comes to that point, Africans and Native Americans and Palestinians ask the question, why is it that your Exodus story that is supposed to be a story of, of liberation of people becomes our annihilation? And so you got to take those questions seriously. And that's what I do in that book. Miriam, however, disappears from the story after Exodus 15. She only reappears in the book of Numbers. And that to me is a second story. So because in that book of Numbers, especially from chapter 12 on to chapter 20, Miriam is in conflict with Moses on his leadership style, on his idea of what should happen in this journey towards where God wants them, in his idea of God, in the way he claims God for himself. And there God is the strange, violent, vengeful, or fatricidal, pestilential God that we come to know. Um, every time somebody raises a question about Moses' leadership, Moses calls God into it and God just obliterates everyone in sight all to secure Moses. Miriam is a totally different story. And so for me, a key there is when Miriam asks, does God only speak through Moses? Or does God also speak through us? And that now, so in Numbers chapter 20, finally, even the male narrator has to say, Moses has messed up, man. This is not God. You, you, you've done the wrong thing. So, but because black theology has taken without critical thinking and embraced the, the patriarchal tradition through Moses, we've run into all sorts of difficulties that we now cannot respond to Africans and Native Americans and Palestinians who ask these questions about the Exodus and about the promised land. Um, if we follow the tradition of the women though, then those questions become no longer a problem for us, but questions that we can actually engage in in a very meaningful way. That's what that first part of the book is saying. And there are some of my male friends who are not too happy with what uh, I have written there. There's one young man who, when I spoke about this at the University of Stellenbosch, threw up his hands literally and said, but this, this is something totally different. This is, throws away my, all my theology. I said, well, yeah, uh, if you can throw away all the theology that is bad for us, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. And so it's, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just deeply grateful for the women who kept on raising these questions um, so that we can grapple with those questions and come to a different conclusion. Um, and, and black theology will be a better theology if we listen to the women in this regard and we go back to what I then call the Mariamic tradition instead of the Mosaic tradition. And it opens up a different kind of response to a whole series of questions confronting us now in the situation in which we live right now. Professor Alan Buzak, thank you so much for this evening and all of what you've said and all of what you've done over the 52 years and more that you've been on this planet and the contribution you've made to Black Liberation Theology. I'm going to invite people in the audience just to probably put one word of what they're taking away this evening. And as I say that, I just want to give you the, the last word, so to speak, Professor, um, as people say what they want to say to you. And some are saying tremendous and, and there's other comments coming in. Um, we have a, a body of students coming through. And as I say, we have nearly 70 students with us here in the Center for Black Theology at Queen's Foundation. And there are more. So tomorrow we're inducting uh, some 25 students. And I know some of them are on this call. So we're so excited to be seeing you tomorrow. 
and we're going to keep going because we know here in the UK there is work to do. And so I'm going to ask you, um, Alan, if you could just finish off by encouraging one and all on this call today in terms of what Black Liberation Theology has done for you in your ministry, in your life, someone who's gone to prison, someone who was prepared to die for the gospel. What did Black Theology do for you then? And what is it doing for you now? And your, your whole title, Theology on the Front Lines, Fighting Pandemics, Discovering Resilience, Rekindling Vitality, where is the vitality of black liberation theology? Can you answer that for us in one and a half minutes, please? Well, uh, if it were not for black liberation theology, I still would have been captive to a very distorted, very perverted form of faith brought to me by the Dutch reform churches um, and their white ideologues. And the liberation that I have felt and the freedom to stand up and speak in all those difficult circumstances comes from that. It made me discover that there really is a difference between the way black oppressed people read the Bible and white privileged powerful people read the Bible. And that is a precious gift um, because uh, when I was young, I rap, grappled with the thing, shall I throw away the Bible? Shall I walk away from Christianity? But because I discovered Jesus um, and Jesus and justice and the one that cannot do without the other, my life was changed. Um, it also gave me the understanding of what the Bible means when it says the joy of the Lord is my strength, not my joy, but how I glory in the joy of God by doing justice in the world and putting the lives of others before my own. That is a joy. And that is what is absolutely worth it. And for all uh, the people, young and older, who are engaging in Black liberation theology, I, I mean, you have made a, a tremendous decision. Don't, don't, don't even think of giving up or walking away from it. Black liberation theology is now more necessary than it was ever before because the world um, has changed, but has not changed for the better um, for all people who are oppressed still in the world. And, 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 but at the same time, as empire is exposed to us in all its naked ugliness, the power of what we have as a faith and the resilience that comes from the faith of our ancestors and the people who've gone before. Um, that is something that the world needs. Rowan Cohn says that, that, that the liberation of black theology is necessary in order to make possible the liberation of humanity is absolutely right. And I believe that. So that's what you are busy doing with. Keep your eye on that Jesus that gives you that. Um, have the joy of the Lord, kindle the joy in your own life. And whatever comes, um, you will find that there is a light that shines in every darkness. That's what I have experienced. And all I can say is, um, in all my life, in all of these years, whatever has happened, nothing has been able to separate me from that firm knowledge, which is actually the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, as Paul tells us. So that's who you are. That's what you're doing. That's what you will be doing for the rest of your lives. God bless you all. Um, in what you do. It's been wonderful to get to know you, to talk to you. And as Dalsi and I are talking and hoping and praying, perhaps uh, at some point uh, we'll see each other face to face um, and we'll continue this conversation. That's all. Thank you so much, Professor Alan Aubrey Buzak. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all the students, David and David and Florence and Caroline. And to everyone on this call, it's been, look how late it is, 10 o'clock for us and midnight for Professor 
and we could still keep going. But there we must leave it for, for one evening and I can feel a part two coming on. <laughs> Watch this space and let's see what we can organise. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. See you next month. Thank you. And we'll tell you more about that as the time goes on. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Thank Good you night. very much, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night.